What if tomorrow morning you woke up to the news that a nuclear power plant had been hit, not in Russia, not in Europe, but here in the United States? Would you know the difference between a minor incident and a major release? And would you know what to do in the first 72 hours? Welcome to Safety Zone. This is not a prediction, and it is not a scare tactic. It is a guide to preparation, based on facts and on lessons from history. Just days ago, Ukraine struck deep into Russia and damaged an auxiliary transformer at the Kursk nuclear power plant. According to Reuters, the reactor had to reduce output by 50%. The International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations body that monitors nuclear safety, confirmed there was no radiation leak, but the taboo line was touched. That incident shows that nuclear facilities are not off limits, and that raises a direct question for Americans. What if one of our own plants was targeted in a crisis? Or what if an accident caused by war created a radiation release? The United States operates 90 plus nuclear reactors across more than two dozen states. According to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, nearly one-fifth of America's electricity comes from these reactors. They are reliable and heavily protected, but they are also part of the world, and the world has become more dangerous. Tonight, we will break this down into clear layers. First, the mild scenario, where damage is contained and the issue is mainly power supply. Second, the intermediate scenario, where a limited release forces evacuations or shelter in place. Third, the severe scenario, where a direct hit produces fallout that spreads far beyond the immediate site. For each layer, we will ask, what happens to the United States? What happens to your household, and how do you prepare? Stay with me until the end, because we will also look at which U.S. plants experts consider more exposed, not to spread fear, but to give you context for why preparedness is not just theory. The most likely scenario in any conflict is not a reactor exploding, but the surrounding grid being damaged. This is what happened at Kursk. A drone hit the transformer yard, not the reactor itself. According to the International Atomic Energy Agency, transformers and auxiliary systems are outside the containment dome. They connect the plant to the wider grid. Damage here can force reactors to shut down or reduce output, creating strain on the network, but without releasing radiation. For Americans, the effect would feel like a blackout or a rolling outage. The Department of Energy reminds us that nuclear plants, like other power stations, need external power lines to stabilize operations. If those lines are cut, the reactors can go into safe shutdown, but the grid feels the pinch. Ask yourself, if your region lost a major source of electricity, could you keep your family comfortable for a day, two days, three days? How long would your fridge keep food safe without power? Do you have a backup for charging phones if the outage lasts more than a day? Would you have light at night, a way to cook, a way to stay warm or cool depending on the season. This is where basic prepping overlaps with common sense. A small generator, a set of rechargeable batteries with a solar charger, a camping stove with proper ventilation, and a few gallons of stored water are not signs of paranoia. They are signs of foresight. Think back to the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack in 2021, when fuel deliveries in the southeast stalled and gas lines formed. That was not war, it was criminal ransomware. But the effect was the same, supply shock, panic buying, and stress. The lesson is clear. Even without radiation, a strike on a plant can translate into power instability, higher energy prices, and disruptions to daily routines. Here's a quick mini recap. In the mild scenario, the visible part is a local fire or a blackout. The invisible part is the ripple of power costs and outage schedules. Your preparation here is simple. Redundancy in light, heat, cooking, and water. Nothing fancy, just enough to ride out days of grid instability. But what if the strike is not limited to the grid? What if the containment is breached even slightly? That takes us to the next level. Imagine that a missile or a drone penetrates the outer structures and damages equipment closer to the reactor core. According to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, reactors are built with multiple layers of shielding, including steel reinforced concrete domes designed to withstand impacts and internal pressure. 
but no system is perfect. A partial breach could lead to a controlled or uncontrolled release of radioactive steam or contaminated water. History gives us examples. In 1979, the accident at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania caused a partial meltdown and a release of radioactive gases. The release was limited, and according to the NRC, the health effects on the public were minimal, but the psychological impact was massive. Thousands of residents fled, rumors spread faster than official guidance, and trust in the industry collapsed. In an armed conflict, such a release would trigger immediate shelter in place orders or evacuation in a defined radius. According to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, shelter in place means staying inside, sealing windows and doors, and waiting for official clearance. Evacuation means organized departure along routes announced by authorities, with shelters prepared at designated sites. Ask yourself, do you know what the evacuation routes in your area are? If sirens sounded tonight, would you know which road to take first? Do you know where your family would regroup if phones failed? Do you have a paper map with alternative routes in case highways are blocked? For shelter in place, do you have plastic sheeting, tape, and enough food and water to stay indoors for 48 to 72 hours? Could you keep children calm in a sealed room for two days? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services advises that potassium iodide can protect the thyroid from radioactive iodine, but only when recommended by authorities. It is not a magic pill, and it does not protect against all forms of radiation. The point is not to self-medicate. The point is to have information and modest supplies ready. Here is your mini recap. In the intermediate scenario, the visible part is sirens, advisories, and movement of people. The invisible part is anxiety, rumors, and trust under pressure. Your preparation here is communication plans, shelter supplies, and knowledge of routes. But what if the strike is worse, not limited, but a direct hit that breaches the core? That is the scenario everyone fears, and it is the one we must face now. The worst case scenario is a direct strike that breaches the core and releases large amounts of radioactive material. This is what the world saw at Chernobyl in 1986 and Fukushima in 2011, though Fukushima was triggered by a natural disaster. The difference between contamination and fallout matters here. Contamination refers to radioactive material deposited on surfaces, objects, or people in a limited area. Fallout refers to particles carried by the wind and weather, spreading radiation over a much wider area. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, fallout can travel hundreds of miles depending on wind speed, altitude, and precipitation. That means a strike in one state could affect food, water, and health in neighboring states. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention explain three basic principles of protection, time, distance, and shielding. Time means reducing the duration of exposure, distance means moving away from the source, and shielding means putting dense material, such as concrete or soil, between you and the radiation. Ask yourself, do you have an internal room or a basement where your family could stay for a day or two? Could you block light leaks and create a safe, calm space inside your home? Do you have enough clean water stored for everyone in your household for three full days? If you had to stay indoors for 72 hours, could you feed your family without opening the door? Do you have a hand crank radio or a battery powered NOAA radio to receive official updates if cell towers are down? And if schools or workplaces were unreachable, how would you reconnect once the immediate threat had passed? These questions may feel heavy, but they are practical. A strike of this level would not only be a health crisis, it would be a political and economic shock. Markets would reel, air travel would be disrupted, and confidence in safety systems would take years to rebuild. This is where community resilience matters. If your neighbors know you and you know them, sharing skills and resources can turn a month of stress into a manageable period. Here is your mini recap. In the severe scenario, the visible part is dramatic images of smoke and evacuations. The invisible part is the slow erosion of confidence in systems that anchor modern life. 
Your preparation here is not perfection. It is margin, redundancy, and calm. But this is not the end of the story, because the question is not only how bad it can get, but where it could happen. Which plants in the United States would be more exposed, and why should you care? Stay with me, because that answer is coming in a moment. The United States operates reactors across the Midwest, the South, and the East Coast. According to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, most are designed to withstand natural disasters, aircraft impact, and internal failures. But exposure comes from geography and context. Coastal plants such as Turkey Point in Florida or Diablo Canyon in California are close to large population centers and to international waters. These sites face not only storm surge and hurricane risk, but also the challenge of evacuation in heavily populated coastal corridors. Plants near borders, such as those along the Great Lakes, sit within reach of potential long-range systems from abroad, and also raise questions about cross-border coordination with Canada. Sites in seismically active zones like Diablo Canyon in California or facilities near the New Madrid Seismic Zone in Missouri face compounded risks. Fukushima showed how a natural disaster can turn into a nuclear crisis in a matter of hours. None of this means American plants are unsafe. Regulators stress that U.S. facilities undergo constant safety reviews, hardened defenses, and security upgrades since 9-11. But location shapes potential impact, and impact shapes preparation. Public opinion reflects this tension. According to Gallup, nearly half of Americans remain skeptical of nuclear energy, even though the industry provides almost one-fifth of U.S. electricity and has one of the strongest safety records among power sources. Ask yourself, do you know where you live in relation to the nearest nuclear plant? And how many miles separate your home from that site? If an alert came through, would you understand whether you are inside the 10-mile emergency planning zone where protective actions are immediate, or the 50-mile zone where food and water supplies could be monitored and restricted? Would you know which local agency is responsible for sending that message? And have you ever considered what it would mean for your household budget if agriculture in your state was restricted for weeks? Here is your mini recap. The visible part is a map of facilities with circles drawn around them. The invisible part is what those circles overlap, from highways and rivers to farms, warehouses and neighborhoods. Preparation here begins with awareness. If you know your distance from a plant, and you know your planning zone, you can filter signals faster ignore rumors, and act with clarity instead of fear. We have walked through three layers of risk. The mild scenario, where damage is contained to the grid, and the issue is power outages. The intermediate scenario, where a limited release forces shelter or evacuation. The severe scenario, where a direct hit releases fallout and triggers national consequences. For each layer, preparation is possible. Not perfect, but enough to buy time, space, and calm. This is not about living in fear. It is about living with clarity. The Kursk incident in Russia showed that even in war, nuclear plants can be touched. The lesson for Americans is not to assume it will never happen here, but to build resilience in case it ever does. According to FEMA, even three days of supplies a communication plan, and awareness of official channels can make the difference. According to the NRC, U.S. plants are robust and monitored, but no system is beyond all risk. The bigger lesson is this. In a world of overlapping crises, resilience is not a luxury. It is a responsibility. Ask yourself tonight, if your phone buzzed with an alert about a nuclear plant, what would you do in the first 10 minutes? Do you know where to go? who to call, what to trust. If the answer is no, you can change that this week with small, affordable steps. And those steps are what turn a frightening headline into a manageable challenge. If you found value in this breakdown, subscribe to Safety Zone and turn on notifications. In our next episode, we will look at another weak point in modern life, the risk of a cyber blackout and how to prepare for it before it arrives. Stay informed, stay prepared, 
and stay level-headed.